Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, CSAC's um, How Black Music Shapes Us discussion. We want to thank everybody for coming out and joining us on this celebratory day, Juneteenth. Um, we have everyone here, but we're waiting for one person to come in, but we'll get things started as we wait for that person. Uh, just a few things I'm gonna share with you guys. Just give me one second. So this is a discussion of the importance and history of black music, as well as the significance of Juneteenth. Um, <clears throat> we'll be talking to a, a few songwriters, artists, um, Grammy Award winning producers here are all joining us on this conversation. Um, for those who you are unaware, CSAC is a performer rights organization, a PRO, and we represent thousands of, thousands of affiliates um, and more than one million songs on behalf of songwriters, composers, and music publishers. <clears throat> and we're thrilled to have these amazing affiliates with us today. We'll get to the introductions, but just in a moment, um, I wanna explain some ground rules. In order to make sure we have the best dialogue and remind everyone that this is a safe space uh, for our panelists and for our attendees, this is the only way we can have an honest conversation. So um, you will notice that this is being recorded and will only release parts of the discussion once we have permission from our panelists. Therefore, please do not record on your screens. Again, thank you all for being here. For the media, if you need to reach out for any panelists to ensure they're quoted accurately and in context, please email communications at csac.com. That's S-E-S-A-C.com. And we make sure you get connected. Um, again, my name is Mario Prince. I'm the Senior Director um, of Creative uh, Services here in LA. I am joined by James Leach. James, feel free to introduce yourself to the people. For anybody who doesn't know me, <laughs> salute. James Leach, Vice President of Creative Services, Writer Publisher Relations, as it was formerly called, here at CSAC. And uh, I'm glad to be able to uh, host this, co-host this event, which is uh, very insightful, very, in, what I hope to be a very insightful uh, program for those of you that do not know the history of Juneteenth. Uh, join us for the celebration, join us for the review, some education, and uh, we hope to, to uh, initiate celebration and joy and inspiration, not only in Juneteenth, but Black Music, Black Music Month, and all of that entails for the rest of this month and going forward throughout the year. This is turning into a big year on many fronts, so we're excited to really be a part of uh, are doing our, our part to push the initiative forward. So, you know, more power to the people. <laughs> that's right, that's right. right. All right. Now, um, I, I was gonna introduce our panelists, but I think I'm allowed them to introduce themselves because um, nobody does it better than yourself. So right. <laughs> I'm gonna start off um, with the person who just joined us, the one and only Brian Michael Cox. Thank Yo. you for joining us, man. Our people. Yes, yes. Happy Why don't you tell them who you are? I want to give a big shout out to my big brother, Greg Curtis. I see you, brother. Sup, baby? <laughs> <laughs> What's happening, B. Cox? <laughs> it's good to see you, my brother. Good to see everybody, man. Um, Brian Michael Oops. Cox, man. I've been in uh, I've been in this business for a little over 20 years. And uh, I started with CSAC. Greg Curtis is actually the, the person who introduced me to the whole PR, you know, the PRO of CSAC, he introduced me to the game, this music game, and taught me a lot. And CSAC was the first step uh, in me, you know, getting into this game. So, um, B. Cox, I've, uh, you know, I've made a lot of records for, from Mar 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 Mariah Carey to Usher to Mary J. Blige to Justin Bieber to most recently LMA. Mm -hmm. um, um, a, a lot of people throughout the years, and I'm happy to be here. And um, you know, uh, it's great to have this conversation. I think that we are in a space where there's a huge enlightenment happening. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, 
Um, and not on our part. I think that I think that we've always been kind of enlightened. You know what I mean? We've always had these conversations amongst our community. Mm -hmm. I think now that other communities are now seeing the the, the realness of this and the intensity of it, um, and they are um, you know intrigued and they want to you know the people that want to help they want to help. Um, and um, I, I I think it's just a great you know a great time for us to really use our voices and use our talents to um to kind of just enlighten the rest of the world about you know our struggles you know what i mean yeah so happy juneteenth to everybody happy juneteenth, happy juneteenth. yes sir yeah. um next on our list we have the one and only greg curtis greg curtis once you go ahead he's a grammy award winning music producer songwriter um why don't you tell me a little bit more about yourself Hello, everybody. Happy Juneteenth. All right. Um, my name is Greg Curtis. Uh, I've been with CSAC since I was 14 years old. So we don't want to do the math. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay if you do. <laughs> uh, it's been 40 years. So, um, yeah, born and raised in Houston, Texas, right along with my brother, Brian Michael Cox. And uh, great to see you too, brother. Um, Great to see everybody on the panel. Uh, yeah, I've worked for many people over the years. Uh, Yolanda Adams, uh, initially. And of course, many, many people in between Yolanda and, and Keisha Cole and Chris Brown, uh, Eric Clapton, Earth, Wind and Fire. Uh, you name it, Christina Aguilera. <laughs> I was senior vice president, senior vice president of Hollywood Records for four years. Uh, in uh, 1997, and uh, it was it was it was a great opportunity and great things to learn over there. So I've been in the game for quite a while, and I actually discovered that young man over there. I'm a young man. He absolutely did. He absolutely did. <laughs> Took a Yamaha keyboard, battery <laughs> came in my studio, and blew my mind. I was like, "What?" <laughs> absolutely just, did. You just well, well how, how did you get all this music come out this Yamaha keyboard with batteries in it, bro? <laughs> and uh, so I've been in the game a long time, and I love C Sack, and I, I love uh, I love Brian and James and Mario. I love you guys, man. And thank you for so much for being supportive, even to me uh, throughout the years. And I'm glad we're here to have this discussion. Right. Much thank love. You. Likewise. Thank you, man. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You're an important part of this conversation today. Absolutely. Next, we have uh, Jimmy James. Jimmy James is an artist, songwriter, creative director, motivational speaker. She's an L.A. native like myself. Uh, <laughs> she also co-founded Boss Academy to equip a new generation of creatives with the tools to transcend, transcend industry limits. Uh, she connects music, art, fashion, and lifestyle with super producer Wild Jones. Uh, their music blends pop, alternative trap, and heavy bass with an 80s flair. Thank you, Jimmy. Feel free to, to, to elaborate on that and, and, and greet the audience, if you may. Thanks, guys. Um, first, I just want to say I love you. I feel you in my bones and my blood. We're in such a great space um, at this time where I'm just, you know, excited about the awakening. Thank you, Mario, for the intro. And thank you, James. Uh, I have to share when I first joined uh, with CSAC, I remember Brian Michael Cox and Greg Curtis as the, the faces that I would see the most and uh, at the parties. I love CSAC uh, events. They're always uh, very tasteful and just really amazing people. And um, I was very inspired when I got the invitation to, to be amongst you guys to speak because I remember just being like, wow, wow, wow. I, I would love to one day you know, be on a panel, you know, and speaking, let alone be with you guys, uh, you know, in this panel. So I'm just really grateful. I think everything uh, is has come full circle and we're definitely in a cycle of progression, you know, and um, a lot of my relationships and my work um, has been really in the indie world. Uh, for, for a while I've been, you know, uh, grinding, in the paint and going hard, uh, trying to find my place, my way in, in music and finding out um, just, 
I guess, bridging the gaps in the world between the indie artists and the music industry. Because growing up in Los Angeles, you know, I grew up, James Ingram was my godfather, rest in peace. Uh, so I grew up kind of in the business, but, uh, and, and learning my craft. Uh, I have, you know, family that's in TV and film. So I've always been paying attention to uh, the arts and studying, but it's just been a, a really interesting journey uh, to come here and, you know, have be able to share all of my experiences as an artist and now so connected to the people as an influencer and a motivator. So um, if that all makes sense, uh, I have so much to say, but in a nutshell, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and looking to be more and more present with you guys as we lead this generation and so many into this next stage of our evolution. Amen. Thank you. Um, next, we got Wild Jones. Wild Jones is an American music director, composer, producer, key bass player, the Baltimore native, and awful, all, often referred to as the sauce. He's the go to guy for many A list artists and music directors. Wild's known for organizing superstar arena tours. I know he did that with Post Malone last year a lot. Um, with his intuitive approach to music production, he's worked on many television productions, including the Grammys, the American Music Awards, the MTV Awards, the Super Bowl. And I must say, like, if you guys don't know, like, I'm a DJ and I do parties with Wild Jones and Jimmy James, and we throw some yeah. real fire LA parties. Um, so he is a jack of all trades. Um, I salute you. Thank you, Wild, for being here. Much appreciated, sir. Yes, sir. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. It's a little funny. But uh, thank you so much, guys. And honored to be on this panel with these legends. Um, Wild Jones here, music producer, music director, Post Malone, Bryson Tiller, uh, Sway Lee, Jimmy James. And, you know, I'm just a student, still a student. I always will be a student. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, last but not least, we have Coco Sarai. Coco is a Grammy winning award, Grammy award winning songwriter. Um, she's worked with Anderson Pack and the legendary Dr. Dre. Um, her latest single is Big Dummy. Y'all can check it out now, available on all platforms. She is super, super dope. If you don't know about her, get to know her. Um, Coco, please, please greet the crowd. Uh, happy Juneteenth, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say uh, thank you for having me here. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this panel. Um, and I'm grateful to uh, be able to be, be a part of opening up, being a part of opening up this conversation, something that I feel is very much needed, um, and to learn as well as give whatever I can from this space, you know? So that's really all I got to say, but thank you. <laughs> all right. Very nice, very nice. Absolutely, I, cool. I do wanna give one more thank you to all the CSAC staff, creative services, um, our marketing team, um, John Josephson and Kelly. Um, we really, really thank you guys for supporting us and giving us this platform for everybody to speak today. So thank you very much to the CSAC staff and uh, let's get into this. Cool. Well, uh, l let me start with uh, Juneteenth as, as the name. Uh, Juneteenth stands for June 19th, commemorates the day that slaves were freed in the United States. Um, slaves were freed in 1865, June 19th, 1865, officially. However, the Emancipation Proclamation was actually signed two and a half years earlier, January 1st, 1863. And there's a variety of reasons why uh, it didn't, that, that news didn't travel down to the, the Confederates in uh, Texas and the South. Um, some say that the message got, uh, the messenger was assassinated or murdered trying to deliver that message. 
Others say that, um, you know, just some of the Confederate forces wanted to maintain uh, the economy of the South. So they withheld that information for as long as they could. And it wasn't until, um, you know, Major Granger, or to be exact, Major General Gordon Granger, with a, a troop of Union soldiers in uh, the amount of 2,000 troops landed in Galveston, Texas. And upon the surrender of uh, Lee, on top of the, the, the arrival of, of uh, Granger in Galveston, the resistance broke down and uh, Juneteenth was born. Um, before I get into the music, as, as residents of Texas, Greg and Brian, can, I'd, I'd like to ask both of you your experiences uh, as it relates to Juneteenth, as you were young men of color coming up, what that meant to you, the significance of, of what that meant to you, and I'm going to come back around to how that musically ties into all of this, this discussion today. But what did, uh, what were your experiences with Juneteenth, uh, especially being in Texas? Uh, Brian, I'll start with you. For me, I mean, you know, I, I spent my, you know, my whole childhood in Texas. I was born in Miami, but I spent my entire childhood in Texas. So, um, um, I didn't know a world without Juneteenth. Okay. To keep it real, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Until I when I, when I, when I started traveling and I moved to Atlanta, I started living in other places, I realized that Juneteenth was very specific to Texas. Um, and when I moved out of Texas, I, you know, this is ironic, crazy, but a lot of people look down on Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? A lot of people, especially when you know, I, I, you know Atlanta is what like the second blackest town in 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 in, in, the, in America, I'm like behind right. like DC or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, a lot of people looked down on Juneteenth when I you know when I first came up here, um, because it was like oh you know we were you know I don't know how how many years we were the blacks the slaves were were free before we got. The news back in the day, news travel. Obviously, there was no internet, no telephone. You know what I mean? Right. Travel slow, and people look down. Like I'm, I'm gonna keep it a hundred. Like a lot of black people, especially in this city of, in Atlanta, looked down on Juneteenth when I moved here, and mm -hmm. um, and get, kind of made you feel bad about celebrating it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> They look down on you, like yo, you you celebrated the fact that y'all were still slaves after we were the Emancipation Proclamation, and right. Um, I don't think they really understood why it was important or the importance of it. And I would say <laughs> this, in this great awakening that we're having as a culture, I think that it's amazing that, you know, that, that part is amazing that people are starting to learn this history and understand the importance of it and not look down on it and really embrace it. This is the first year I've seen people really go hard for Juneteenth. You know what I mean? Right, right. Um, That's true. And, and Greg could speak to the, you know, to our experience. Like we grew up celebrating Juneteenth. It was something that we... Juneteenth was... Juneteenth was something that just was... barbecue chops on the, on the, on the uh, Juneteenth, man. I learned yeah. how to make serious barbecue, son. For real? Uh, serious barbecue. And, and, you know, to, to Brian's point about <clears throat> when I, when I um, went to New York, I believe I went to New York in uh, 80, maybe 87. Mm. I was uh, working with Bernard Bell and Teddy Riley. I was actually signed to Bernard Bell and Teddy Riley. <clears throat> and um, so I was there the whole time that they were doing um, the kissing game and remember the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was, you know, I, I saw a young 15 year old Rodney Jerkin, 16 year old yeah. Rodney Jerkin in the studio hit factory. It, you know, it was a wild time. And uh, when Juneteenth came around, I said, Hey man, are we having a party? And they was like, for what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Juneteenth. Right. Man. <laughs> what you talking about? They was like, oh. Yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, so it was, it was, it was kind of wild that not many people celebrated it the way we did in Texas. And um, 
But Juneteenth is significant. I mean, <laughs> we, that was more important than Fourth of July or anything 100%, else. 100%. 100%. Like, you know, Juneteenth was like Black Christmas for us, you know. It was, right, like, right. It was wild, man. And, and to be honest with you, I didn't even know what it was for many, many years until yeah. I was like, oh, oh, this is what happened. I thought they said, yeah, they got the, they got the dates wrong and mm. we didn't get the, <laughs> right. got the dude late. Conveniently got the dates yeah. wrong, you know? You know what I'm saying? So um, it actually yeah. became a state holiday uh, June 19th, 1990. So, you know, that, wow. that also speaks to, to the significance, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, the internet was late too, huh? Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why, why do you guys feel like they, they look down upon that day, though? That's well, what I was going to ask. I would like to jump in on that too. Um, like during the early 1900s, kind of in between 1900 and 1920, uh, the world, you know, U.S. was really trying to show their global power at that time. And of course, we're going through segregation laws and they had this whole thing. They were rejecting foreigners and stuff like that. And they kind of made it to where uh, those who celebrated this movement of freedom for Black people, you know, they kind of looked at it as un-American or, you know, like unpatriotic. So I find um, this holiday, uh, has some misconceptions about it, you know, because really it's been a movement in itself. You know, it's had cycles of dark days and uh, and 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 celebratory days. And so, also, I had taken note. I watched this um, documentary. I thought it was pretty interesting that um, uh, Antonio Maceo Smith, he was an educator in a Dallas Negro Chamber of Congress. He actually um, set out to build an exhibit. Um, and uh and presented it you know as you know a state fair event and you know of course he had a lot of uh white folks that didn't want it to happen try to protest uh, you know about it but he went over the government's head and uh somehow received a hundred thousand dollar grant and actually built this and named it the hall of negro life and so that was actually completed in 1936 and they actually had the largest uh juneteenth with 46,000 black folks um, there. And, and unfortunately, like a lot of things that we do build, uh, it was demolished right after the affair. But, but the spirit that was left with black folks was, was remained. And so I find it really interesting that we're, we're in a cycle right now where we've had our dark days and our bright days. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. definitely someone who believes in uh, that balance, uh, uh, accepting the light and the dark because light wouldn't exist without the dark. So we have to kind of um, just start re-educating -educa folks on the history and knowing that this is a cycle, you know, and even in the Bible, it refers to uh, history repeating itself. So I'm just excited about being in a very um, space where where folks are interested in being educated, not just white folks, mm -hmm. but black folks. Right. Like Greg said, yeah. a lot of us didn't even know, like yeah. I actually, you know, uh, yeah. to be honest with you, had to do some research because I That's felt true. like, hey, if I'm gonna speak on this platform and, um, folks are, are listening, we got to be responsible for the knowledge that we spread and, and do the work. You know what I mean? So we're at a point where right now we, we have time to do the work. So anyway, I thought that that was great, that, that, that Juneteenth is actually a progressive movement of freedom that we are still very much, you know, standing for. No, right. so. that's, that's exactly. And, and today for everybody who may or may not know, but we're, we're dropping a lot of facts today. Um, <laughs> we all have a lot of things to share and just, you know, get your notepad and your pens and feel free to take notes because we're all going to learn and, and educate one another. Uh, I have a um, Brian Michael Cox and Greg Curtis, if you guys can elaborate on this, your thoughts. Uh, music has transitioned like from Juneteenth up until now, every 10 to 20 years. The music reflects the, what the the culture is going through. Right. You know, what what do you guys feel like is going to next? You know, looking back over the history of the transitions from ragtime gospel music to swing to bebop to hip hop to R and B to the content, the lyrical content. Where do you feel like we're going now? 
post this vibe? It's a good, it's a great question, man. Um, yeah, dude. I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep with the kids saying now two Virgils. I'm gonna keep it two Virgils with you. <laughs> um, um, I don't, I don't know, man. You know, I think that, I think that we're in a space where I, I remember when, me growing up, right? Mm -hmm. I remember my mother was very, very adamant about teaching me certain things and instilling certain things. And I think mm -hmm. that, the whole, that the black community as a whole, especially when I think about the eighties, because you know, our parents were fresh off of the civil rights movement. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, they lived it, they experienced it, they, they saw segregation, they, they dealt with it, they dealt with integration and the, and, and the actual ups and downs of integration. You know what I mean? Like they saw it firsthand. Um, so, you know, there were certain things that when you, now you're in, it's, you know, it's 86, 85, 86, and now you're raising a, you know, eight year old or a nine year old black boy, you know what I'm saying? You know, there are things that you are directly connected to when it comes to racism, when it comes to civil rights, when it comes to the black experience growing up in the South, my mother grew up in South Florida, moved to Houston in 1979. You know what I mean? There are things that you directly relate to. You know what I mean? Um, and I didn't have to experience a lot of those things my mother experienced. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I, I was able to live a life that was a little different. Have I had my experience, my, 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 race, my racist experiences with racist cops and things of that nature? Yes. You know, have I, have I had to deal with, you know, white kids calling me a nigga and all that, all that, you know what I'm saying? But not to the extent that my mother did, you know what I mean? And for us, we live in a better society, quote unquote, you know, I want to be very clear, <laughs> quote unquote. Yeah better society, right? A better life, right? So then, okay, we grow up, we become parents, you know, and we have best friends who are white and best friends, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm, you know my, my best friend is married to a white woman. Like we in a space where this is like normal, right? So, so now, you know, I'm raising a, you know, a, a little boy, he's nine years old. He's about the age that I was. My mother started really, really explaining to me what racial tensions were, you know what I mean? And, he knows, you know, Barack Obama as his first president. You know what I mean? He, wow. you know, his best friend, you know, his best friend is, you know, Toby, who lives two doors down from his mom. You know what I mean? Yeah. Little, little white kid who they don't know. You know what I mean? So it's he's like, empowered. He's empowered in a different way now. Right. Exactly, right? right. So, right. so, and I know I'm skipping because Greg has children who are, who are older than him, who are all, you know, I, I know, I know those jobs. I know his kids since they were kids and they're, they're adults now and all of them have their own reality, their own right. perspective of life, right? So it, it's, it's interesting to see when you ask that question, what's happened, what happens next? Because you have that generation, you have people who, are, who, who come from the hood right now who, you know, they, they don't even, they, race is not even an issue for them. They're just looking at right. what, what's their immediate surroundings and they're trying to party, they're trying to get out of the hood. Yeah. You know, this is not even a, this is this is like, what, what we're saying right now, they don't really, they can't even wrap their minds around it because they don't even understand what we understand. Yeah. Right. But you know what, Brian, what, 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 I, what I believe and what I notice that the tension is, is, is so big mm -hmm. uh, and it's caused by so many things. Uh, to, to, to kind of give a, a, a little more light on the question, um, I see uh, white people love our music. Love mm. it. To death. Love it, bro. Love our music. Love and I see white people, I heard a girl, a friend of mine call me a couple of weeks back and she said, yo man, check this chick out. I was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah, it's, just, it's a church girl. She dope. She's like, no, nah, man, that's a white girl. I'm like, whoa. What? <laughs> I'm like, are you serious? Like, what the woman is she? It sounds sound, sound like she's been through slavery. Like, what? I mean, what? where'd she get that, that grit and that dirt and that soul from? So I see music going really kind of backwards and forwards at the same time. Um, <laughs> I see I see R&B, the resurgence of really, I, I, see, I see all of the music coming what you what you would say is back with jazz and mm -hmm. in pop and folk and 
you know, storytellers, I see all of it this time, but now it's coming back around with no color at all. Yeah. This time, mm. it's number one blues artist, but he's white, mm. he's black. You know, he's black from Beverly Hills. He's white. Wow. He's, you know what I'm saying? Wow. He's, I mean, it's so deep. He's, he's, he's black from London. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I see it coming back because everybody's re embracing the world is finally starting to see how important black music and black people have been to music and everything else. But the music is getting a light now. The music is getting a light from the world. And everybody's going, yo, man, you know, uh, man, Marvin Gaye was really. Absolutely. Dope. Right. But like, the, world can, the world can see it now. Because yeah. you got to think like in the 60s when everything was going on. And you, it, the 60s and 70s, you may have like a James Brown like right. really on it and like right. artists really on it. The world right. couldn't put their eyes on it like that. But the, it we, was, we were connected. Like the way that we're connected right. now right. From, a so, from a social media perspective, from an internet yeah. perspective, the world is a lot. The world has always been small, but now the world is a lot smaller. Like, right. <laughs> Well, you've had artists that have spoken on these things for years, you know, yeah. that, that have, like, as you cited, Marvin Gaye, but there's also been Sam Cooke, right. just as there was uh, Bessie Smith, yes, through sir. the delivery of her, her gospel exactly. and her spirituals. You had mm -hmm. Curtis Mayfield, um, mm -hmm. you know, and the Friends of Distinction, you know, those, those groups. Roy um, Ayers. Yeah, yeah. Roy, oh, wow. exactly, exactly. So... Yeah. A song I've been a song I've been listening listening. Sorry, because I just I just thought it's very relevant to this point. But it's a song that's been on repeat in my house for like probably three months, and it's Roy Ayers, "Ain't Got No Time." Yeah. Oh, man. Right. And Woo. it's so funny how that song I forget what year it came out. It was probably in the seventies or late sixties. But again, full circle, the message of that song is 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 with us today you know right. like the war has just begun as he said you know we ain't got time to be tired you know yeah. so like it's just so funny how you know through music even in comedians you i was watching right. Dave Chappelle 20 years ago yeah. so watching, you know stand up from 20 years he's talking about some of the same things same vibes that richie was talking about that dick gregory was right talking now. about right mm -hmm. true story true story well, right right, you know right. is that and I think that a lot of this tension comes from from white America seeing their children love black music and 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 actually okay. live black music so culture, yeah. crazy that you know it's it, and it makes them go wow you know why you know so it's like you can't get, you can't get away from what we bring in the culture because based on our history the slavery and then what we went through I didn't I was in the sixth grade and um, I was going to Parker Elementary mm. in Houston and. I was having a great life as a kid. It was a magnet program. I was playing violin and saxophone and piano and drums. And I'm having a great time, man. I'm having a great time. And I'm sitting at home one night, you know, after doing my homework and chilling and the, the TV pops up and this show is coming on and I'm going, okay, all right, check it out. <laughs> and then I'm looking at this show and I'm going, man, and I'm going, mom, you know, what, 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 what's going on? What is this? What, why are they beating all of What's all these white people beating up on black people? What's what's happening? What's happening? Mm. And it was roots. Mm. And a lot mm. of people don't understand. <laughs> hey man. Wow, man. Let me tell you something, man. Tell them I what still, roots is if they don't know what roots is. Oh, well, they, they don't know today. <laughs> and I, and I looked at I, I I couldn't believe what happened when I saw the first episode of Roots in the in, in, in the sixth grade at a predominantly white school. And oh, you can geez. imagine what the next day of my the next day was at school was like for me. Wow! I went to school like the Tasmanian Devil, <laughs> right? And right. my mother had to come from Bentop Hospital all the way over, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody used to know what it is from Bentop to uh, Fondren. Exactly, one hundred percent. Like, you know, a, a black a, a single black mother in in, in those times, <laughs> you know, because I terrorized the school. I'm angry wow. at everybody. I'm and I'm 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 literally angry. So, piggybacking on, now, the kids that's listening to you know Post Malone and Fetty Wap and all the rest of these people, they don't see no color. 
They literally right. don't. Right. That's, like, Post Malone is their Michael Jackson. And, mm -hmm. you know, they don't see color, man. And, you know, for, for that generation of, of, of racist and white supremacists, they hate seeing that because right. these kids love Post Malone, but they love Fetty Wap, but they love, they love these people, man. You know what I'm saying? They, they, yeah. they love them. They don't, and they don't discriminate. And in their minds, the white supremacist side of them is going, why my kids, you know, love these niggas? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it's the music that's bringing us all together, quietly, silently, like the young lady said, you can't have light without the darkness. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're not being enlightened right now. We're being in right. dark. Right. Well, that's, we're starting oh. to break through. Yeah, yeah, we're starting to break through because... Breaking through. Not starting. We are breaking yeah, we're through. Breaking through. Right. Right. There. Color, man. This music is... I love, I love all this music because there's just no color, man. There's no color yeah. no more. It's starting to come true. Yeah. Uh, Coco, to, uh, did you want to share something? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I, I was just piggybacking off of his story about roots. I'm, I'm from Brooklyn and I'm Jamaican. Uh, and I remember not understanding when I watched it, my grandmother uh, didn't want me to see, see Roots as a kid. And mm. I saw it uh, and I went to school with a bunch of uh, actual Spanish kids. I lived in Bushwick, Brooklyn, wow. so a lot of Spanish people. Um, and I was, I was the chocolate girl, I had locks, I got teased a lot, I had an English Jamaican accent. It just did mm. not make sense in the hood in Brooklyn, you know? Um, and um, so I would get teased and I would end up, you know, fighting. Like, yeah, nah, we just, we just got to throw the hands. Yeah. And my mom, for real, and my mom showed me Roots against yeah. my grandmother's wishes. And I went back to school wailing on everybody. I was upset. Like, what, yeah. do, you, you know, yeah. what do you mean? Instead of my grandmother explaining to me what was happening, she was trying to trying to shelter me and hide me. And my mom saw that as a bad thing because that's what happened to her. So she's like, I'm going to show her everything. But I had to figure out the balance between that anger, what it meant, what these people, first of all, they're not even white. <laughs> like, you know, to me, they look just like it. And they were treating me, you know, in this way. And it was a thing. So... That's what I was just like, yeah, I remember that, I feel that. So that's all I was saying, yeah. I wanted to uh, piggyback off of what you're saying, Coco, that um, I, my observation has been a lot of our anger is, is coming from the oppressed side. And so mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, like, I'm one of those people that I don't really take personal if someone's a racist or whatever their views are. I believe that God gave everybody the right to to, to choose how they believe. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I am offended by, and I feel that, uh, you know, speaking for all of us, we're offended by our right, our God-given right to grow, to grow right. financially. Because mm -hmm. I believe if, we're, if we were all financially doing well, we wouldn't give a fuck who, who <laughs> like us or not. No, right. You know what I mean? Right. And so, so now we're at a point where, 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 where I think it's important that, that we collectively now in this moment start attaching the dollar to the value because our music is one of the most valuable elements of life. When, I, when you think about it. In this uh, industry. Particularly. And this, this is across the, the globe. Yeah. Not world. just Black yeah. Americans, Over but Jamaicans yeah. and uh, right you know, Brazilians, we embody life and joy. When you go out to the club and you're celebrating your, uh, your retirement or your promotion or you're getting married, these are the memories that white folks that everybody across the globe attaches to. And why do we create this environment, this music? This music is environment. Yeah. And so when we create this, you're feeling our joy. You're right. celebrating from our joy. So if, if, every, if there's all these places on earth that mm -hmm. have attached a dollar amount to what they've contributed, like oil or sugar or this or that, black folks have music. This is us. This is what we, this comes from us. And so I think at this point, we have to neutralize our emotions, find a way to neutralize our emotions and get to work. Start uh, putting in place the structures, the financial structures and equating it with the, our contribution to the world and putting that dollar back into our community. So yeah. we can be happy, we can enjoy and we don't have to, we'll have that, that, that financial um, uh, access 
to be able to put all of these different structures in our community that protect us. So we're not having to so much fight and ask for this and ask for that. Like, I don't want to ask for shit. I got what I got. Mm -hmm. So now we need to talk about business on what I got. To maintain yeah. what you have, right. You know what, I, was, I would say this. I'm from Baltimore and I haven't had the opportunity to experience racism at, at a young age. I think because where I'm from, everybody's black. You know, every, yeah. everywhere you go. East or West is black everywhere. So I, I didn't, as a kid, I didn't experience that side of racism with somebody looking at me because of, you know, I, maybe I was too young. Mm -hmm. But I will say, as an adult, when I started moving into the money-making stage, that's when I started to feel it, when it started to be about money a little Hell bit. Oh, yeah. In the mm -hmm. industry, you know, a little bit in the industry and you know when i'm having conversations about real estate and different things oh yeah that's when i started to see like damn like what's going Woo. on right it feels what is like that? wow it feels like they're they're, they're it, you, you start to feel like you, they're boxing you out when you, mm -hmm. when you get the box out level and it's uh -huh. like okay you know wait a second you know i was having conversations with banks about different things, you know, and you know, and, and luckily, you know, for us, we're able to create um, an, uh, you know, a, 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 a natural intellectual property when it comes to our music. You know what I'm saying? So, people, banks, and establishments want to be in business with us on a certain level, right? But that level, threshold, but not enough, not enough to allow you to. to, to, to There's literally a threshold. Right. It's like, all right, you know, you got this catalog, and it's worth right. it. We'll loan you money against that, but then you know my my, yeah. my partner Kip, my partner Kip, who don't have nearly what the, the IP that I have, you know what I mean, could go and walk into a bank and get probably twice as much as I can without leveraging. I you know what I mean, all those validators, right, and IP qualifiers and to, leverage to, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's really interesting. Um, um. And you know what? And I, I, I want to shift. I'm gonna ask a question, to everybody on the board. You know what I mean? Just, just because we were talking about you, while you brought up the music business, and 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 the the how you moved, like you started feeling the the, the tension, right? Yeah. That's when you started feeling the difference. How do you guys feel about them trying to kill the term urban? That was a question I had. I had ready for y'all later, but <laughs> how do you guys feel about there, that? Because and, and Wow asked my question earlier, so yeah. boy, that how do you guys feel about I, I actually am oh. for it because I mean I haven't gotten too much into it, but our music is pop. Pop pop comes from popular, and right. our music is the most popular in the world. So right. technically, exactly. we're pop. <laughs> All right, so let me so right. put that dollar amount to that. <laughs> let me give you. Let me give you guys. A scenario, okay. Here's why I have I, I'm, I'm questioning it because when I came into the music business, there was a lot of black music divisions, black black music de departments were, were were burgeoning, they were thriving, right? The artists who didn't have to cross over, you know what right. I mean? Who would right. sell platinum, double platinum? We make money, we make money hand over fist. Jagged Edge sold three million records, you know right? What I mean? Absolutely. Jay Heartbreak was not a pop record. You know what I mean? To, to when I say pop, to the industry, I mean, right. You know what right. I mean? Columbia Records did not handle Jagged Edge the same way they handled, like, you know, uh, how, how they would handle uh, freaking, you know, uh, uh, what's my man? Uh, Mayor, you know, John Mayer. You know what I mean? They wouldn't, they, they didn't handle it the same way. They wouldn't handle it the same way, right? When I feel like this is a, a, a and, and, and granted, Greg knows, you know, I'm a I'm a conspiracy brother. Now I I I I I look at things from a whole nother lens. Absolutely. We're gonna take away the word urban, right? Which is why I posted what No ID said. We should take away the word pop. Because I feel like what they're getting ready to do is take urban away and black music as we know it is over. You know right. what I'm saying? And I feel like as a black creative. We've always had that 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 safety net. You think about back in the 80s with Gerald Busby and Louis Silas Jr. and all these all these uh, Clarence Avon, all these incredible black people who made sure that we were protected. 
know what I mean? That's how we got Jimmy and Terry. That's how we got LA and Babyface. That's how we got Teddy Riley through this, through this net, this protective net that we call the Black Music Division, which changed in the 90s, or late 90s, or 2000s to urban, right? Yeah. For me, I have, a, I have a little bit of a problem with it. Cause it's like, okay, let's talk about pop then. Let's talk about the word pop. You know what I'm saying? Right. And let's take the word pop out of it because because y'all not gonna hide, you know, behind the word pop now. You know Absolutely. Should take Absolutely. Urban pop, away from pop, us. Mean, pop means white and urban means black. Period. No matter. So, what. Yeah, yeah, that's how it's looked at, right? So yeah. Take away because I, I know when I go have meetings with A and R's and, and uh, executives or whoever, you know, they're like, Brian, can you make pop records, right? Jimmy, I'm like, yo, I made pop records. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. I pop to me like, is cold. Pop is cold for big budget. That's what happened. Yeah, I made pop. Right. <laughs> pop right. is cold word right. for big budget. Right. But that's right. That's a fact. Because you can that's say, you know, you, yes. know you, got, you got a bad was number one for 12 weeks on a pop chart. You know right. What I mean? And people still consider that song a black song. You know right. what I mean? You know, Michael Jackson is the king of pop. But he is exactly. an R&B artist. Oh, when they act, but Brian, when they asked you to make a pop record, you already knew you was getting paid more. You already knew that in your mind. Yeah, but but no, but, but even that, right? But wow, even that, right? I'm looking at them like, what do you mean by pop? I make pop records. So what are you True. saying? We've got to make a pop record. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make what I was was innately uh, natural to me, right? So now, okay, what were you saying? I need to go make an uh, EDM record? You didn't call me for EDM record. My name is Brian Michael Cox. You didn't call me for that. You called yeah, me. They called you for you. You mm. called me because of the records that you know I, you know, if you look back at the trajectory of my career and you called me, you know what I'm saying? You didn't call me to make a record like Max Martin. You didn't call me to make a record like, you know, like Dr. Luke. You called them. You called me for Brian Michael Cox. So you called Timbaland for Timbaland. You called Greg Curtis for Greg Curtis. And you called, you know what I mean? So, why, and, and, I'm, I, and I'm not saying I can't make those kind of, kind of records if I want to, if I'm in the mood to, you know what I'm saying? But I just feel like I don't want people to, I don't want us to get lost so, with them taking titles away, taking our shit away from us in the right. midst of this awakening. Uh -huh. they, they, they should take it all away. They should, if they're gonna take, take everything away, well, that's how the business all was. Wipe it all away. So let's talk about that's how the business was at one point. I'm a little older than all of you, and uh, just a little. And I remember the times <laughs> when uh, I'd look at a billboard when I was interested in getting into the business. I'd be in school and college. I'd go to the the library, and they'd have different periodicals mm -hmm. that that were about the business, and many of which aren't around anymore, such as Cashbox. Radio and records, Billboard was the one that I could relate to mm -hmm. because they seemed to catch everyone. I didn't know that much about radio, and they weren't really opening the doors for me to learn that much about the radio side of things in school. So um, uh, there were no there were no delineations on genre. You know, this is uh, this is seventies going into the eighties, and well, no. This was the set, yeah, 70s going into the 80s. You gotta think back, it's, you know. But you had no delineation. It's all good, baby. You know, you know uh, Sly, you had Sly, you had Slave, you had so many groups that, at Cool in the Gang, Chambers Brothers, those yeah. weren't James Ooh. Brown, Stevie Wonder, right. all of those acts. We knew that it was black music in its soul. It was right. successful. It's so records, man. It's they so sold records. records. The reason those people to get didn't you get mean? put in the box or drop is because they sold records. Yeah. It wasn't until you had these divisions and these names that we started to have these issues started to cultivate. You know, How do you started. think that's yeah, gonna affect great. radio now? I had the fortune of of uh, of working for Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. I started my career there. And I remember when Michael wanted to go by he wanted to be known as the king, mm -hmm. king of music, not just the king. <laughs> there was such a, now who else, is the, Greg, you're laughing. Who was recognized as the king back then? Elvis Presley. There you go. There you go. Wow. Matter of fact, he had a song. Mike has a song when it first came out called Heartbreak Hotel. Changed the title. Had it changed it to this yeah, place. There hotel. you go. Why was that I mean, necessary? 
Yeah. <laughs> Why is that necessary? You see, it's all these little things right. that, that we're aware of that sting to us, that slap us in the face. Right. And it's like, well, you don't see the problem with that? But if James, Elvis I, can't be called the king, why can't this yeah. cat who's now in his prime, in his generation, and his legacy, basically he sold, he outsold you. That's on everybody. Right. I mean, that's that's everybody. That's everybody. So why can't he be recognized as the king? So James, James, I, think, I think this what issue kind of, I think this issue kind of started with Little Richard and, and, and Pat Boone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That's, that's another example. And we can, we can throw Chuck Berry in the mix too. You want yeah. to that? Etta Ed, James. Exactly. Greg, so I, I got a question, James. I got a question, y'all. So, and, and you, you brought up something that really just kind of hit me. You know what I'm saying? We're talking about Michael Jackson wanted to be considered the king. And he wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, he's a black artist. He's making black music, clearly. You know what I mean? And was like, yo, this shit is selling. Like, you know, off the wall, so 10 million records in 1980. And right. it was unheard of. Right. You know what I mean? Like, literally unheard of. Right. Yeah. 10 million records, it was unheard of, right? Then he comes back around in Thriller, which we now know is the biggest selling album of all times, uh, uh, going up yeah. against the Eagles' greatest hits. <laughs> By the way, it's not even like an Eagles album. It's a yeah, the whole collection, collection of yeah, right. fucking hits, right? It's not even, you right. know what I mean? And, and Michael Jackson made an album that he made, it's not a greatest hits Michael Jackson. That must have been, it's a new album with nine brand new songs on it, outsold, Everything, right? And then we talk about an artist like Prince, right? Let's talk about Prince, who I think really um, tr transcended genre, transcended, you know what I mean? Just <laughs> imagine the work, hmm. the work Man. that Prince had to do or Michael had to do to say, yo, I'm going to, like, we're going to transcend genre. Right. Still, but our shit is still black, though. Prince, Prince was oh, absolutely, black absolutely. all the way to the absolutely. end. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was still like, yo, but I'm black as I'm black as fuck. You know what I mean? This is this is what brings me to my black question black. with with the with James, Greg, and B. Yeah. So you have these divisions, but you know they had radio play and it was segmenting like urban, urban yeah. AC. Yeah. There's that. So we take away urban, or we take away pop. How does that affect radio now? How do you service radio now? Well, I, I feel you like- You gotta change the charts. You can't, you can't have those same titles on the charts. So you gotta change the whole everything now. Yeah, they gotta change the whole, they, they can go back to the infrastructure that they was, once had, because you still had radio stations such as WBLS. Mm -hmm. That was a very prominent radio station that, uh, uh, that and, and founded or gave the, the jumpstart to many VJs that were hosts on, uh, uh, BET, and, and they're still doing their thing in the business today in a variety of ways, and I, but I a variety of areas rather. But yeah, radio doesn't necessarily have to change because you had programmers and people that were servicing our records, and those those records got now they may have have had to jump through extra hoops to get mm. those records played, and if the PDs didn't want to play them, then they took them to a station that did. But wow. you know. The, wow. It's, you know, we can't, technology allows us right now, I always tell people this, whoever will listen, <laughs> that technology is such now that you can get, you can put your music out there with the Without right that. team around you, the right energy okay. around you. The world will hear your music. Am I not correct? Absolutely. The world will Absolutely. hear your music right. and do what, and the records will do what it does. Because yeah. at the d end of the day, a song is a song is a song. All right. A song right. is a good song. It's a good song. It has the ability to transcend genres and the ability to transcend your spirit mm -hmm. to the place that that author intended it to be. Well, you know, the, the important thing to know about, I got several things I would like to talk about, but what we're talking about here is music. And right. you got to think about, when you think about the power of quote unquote urban music or black music, but when you think about the power of music in general, I mean, you got people like Jim Croce, uh, you know, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Bob Dylan. Uh, uh, you got you got great artists, white artists that are just that I consider. I don't, you know, I consider those guys just as important as as any other black writer or producer, singer, songwriter. Sure. 
So, um, with I don't even know how to say it with 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 the music today. Well, well, with the opportunity that we have. Okay, here's my point. Black music is so powerful that the upper echelon or the elite or the deep state or whatever the hell you want to call them, they want to control this shit. Mm. So this is, this is what I'm thinking from a metaphysical perspective. Black music is so deep. So that's why they add all of these conspiracy theories with Beyonce and Rihanna and she's with the Illuminati and the blood, the, 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 the sacrificing and the blah, 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 blah. So you got to imagine how powerful this is where a guy like George Soros or, or he, you know, you know, I want, I want to get a piece of that, that chick, that, 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 that Rihanna, that Beyonce, Jay Z. I, 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 I want to be in the business. I want to, I want to control yeah. that shit, man, because I can yeah. do something. So you gotta think like this music is so powerful, man, that it causes some people, some people with power, to be so freaking sinister. Okay, we don't want to talk about pedophilia. We don't want to talk about all of the things that are connected mm. with our music that these people. Mm. Try to connect themselves with, and because you know the the the, the reason why you know uh, uh, Brian Cox wasn't a great artist is because he refused to be uh, to drop his pants. Mm. Amen. Oh. Thank you, God. Let's really talk about it. Let's really talk about. Yeah, he, he had oh. the reason why Greg Curtis because he I refused to drop my pants, son. Yeah. Dave Chappelle on him. I, I refused to do certain things. True so story. you got to understand the power of us, the music. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about how us, black music, changed the world? If you change the world, we're changing it every day because people want to be a part of it, connected to that dollar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With that, you got to think about it. Black music in America, black people in America, we represent 1.4 trillion in spending annually. Right. We're talking about 14%, 15% of the, the, of the population. Mm -hmm. Come on, man. Yeah. And our music and, and our dollar stays in our community only for six hours. Right, 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 right. Oh, Greg, can uh, I ask that, you a question? What's that, Greg, Jenny? I want to yes. ask uh, in terms of the next step, because I think we're all in alignment with, you know, those things that you mentioned. Um, and again, going back to establishing uh, perhaps like a black music union or uh, some yeah. type of union, like they have SAG, they have the after they got all these different unions that protect the foundation of or core principles of these groups of individuals right. i feel like what do you guys think about constructing a foundation that uh, at this time because we're at a very <coughs> powerful time speaking point now and and business doing business because right. right now we got to also remember that Folks, all these corporates that are coming along and putting the sign in, in the, the window saying we support in solidarity, we got to also remember that the shit may not have really changed inside their heart. It may just be a trend because it's business. Man, and, and as that? soon as trends start, well, you know, rolling, woo. companies jump on board woo. and they they say, okay, this is business. So cool. Let's That's take that. the emotion out of it. Let's That's take right. the emotion out of it. And let's do business. Right. right. Here well, we this, are this now. Coalition. 100%. I'm sorry, Jimmy. I didn't mean to, or in Brian, I'm sorry. No, it's all good. I didn't mean no. to, to interrupt, but I just wanted to shoot this out there because we're definitely going on a roll. Um, there are coalitions that are out there now that we can join forces with and you can support so we can move the needle forward. You mm -hmm. got the Black, Black Music Coalition, which is founded by some artists and, and musicians and executives from out of the UK. Join forces with these folks. Okay. You got You've got organizations like the Living Legends Foundation, nice. which love to be able to pass that knowledge and mentorship, mm -hmm. create mentorship opportunities for execs and artists so that they can further their career and empower themselves. We have to, we have to remember, we have the talent base. We That's just have it. to do a little, di little bit of digging and see what this man's been doing over here, mm -hmm. this lady's been doing over here, and help, help bring them in to mm -hmm. a more solidified base that we can yeah. work from. To, yeah, add to, larger to, add, to add to that too, I, I feel like we, we really need to have ownership in our own. Exactly. Oh, no, absolutely. Equity. Because, absolutely. because Equity. We, yes, we That's must align key. with these organizations, but we also have to own our own. You know, right. there should be more major black labels. There should be more major black publishers. And if they aren't, we have to know our value in order 
to negotiate some equity and that's right. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Well, and, the kind of deals we engage in, but we, but you know, it only going to come if we, if we unify. That's right. 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 Well, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if, if black people, if we as a collective had our own economic base, we wouldn't even be having that. Right. That's right. 100%. And that's what needs to happen right now. Instead of, right. you know, we can go on and on and on about the stories and what we've been through. But now I think we need to take this time to further this conversation, set up meetings, more meetings mm -hmm. and initiatives and start doing a census of who's in our circle that is talented in this area, that area, and wants to volunteer on starting to get our own foundation together here. And like James said, connecting with the, the Black Music Coalition in UK and the Living Legends. Let's, mm -hmm. let's just do it. Because right. these, these terms and these this equity, like like a, lo a large amount, <laughs> let me get to talking now. <laughs> why, why you haven't heard me on the radio? And James will tell you, I've definitely been known for not being down with the shit. And so because of that, I'm thankful to God that it put me on a path of having to really just uh, speak my peace with God and say, okay, this must be a different journey for me. And I know that there's going to be a time for me that I'm gonna be able to lead in politics, in music, and, and God showed me it years ago and now here we are. So I'm like, okay, Hey, it's time. It's time. Let's do the work. Let's do the work because I can't without you guys, without the vets, without the uh, the songwriters, the successful people who have made it on the major platform. You know, without you guys, it's hard for people like me who have been trucking independently and boxed out for years. It's hard for us to even you know make change or movement. So, because I've been looking at these contracts for years and being like what the fuck does this say? Why is this a long ass run on sentence that I can't fucking understand? Or what my uh, fellow over here who do can't afford a lawyer can't understand. Mm -hmm. It's blatant in your face that it's not for us to understand. So when are we going to start speaking up about these things and saying, Hey, we, we don't understand this language. And in school, I learned this was a run on sentence and it doesn't, it does not it equate doesn't to, to my benefit and my community. And if you don't want me to win, I'm mm. out. That's right. what, that's the question we need right. to ask from our counterparts is, so if I sign on this dotted line, you get how much for 12 years and then a, a, another 15 years? Mm. And how much equity are you making? And how much are you putting up to own that? How much? Because it ain't enough. Yeah, and why do these contracts only uh, uh, say what, what is demanded of us, but there's no liability or accountability in these contracts Ooh, for, for right. what I'm Back. signing on? But do right. I have a choice? Or am I going to be blackballed if I don't sign it or if I go up against yeah. it or if I ask right. questions right. about transparency about my business? It's time now, like you said, Mario, let's put the, let's start talking about what the value needs to be. And for the vets who have been, who've seen so many contracts and, and mm -hmm. negotiated so many deals with different levels of power, mm -hmm. like, like let's, let's move, let's get this information down because I feel like collectively we're at a time where we can actually say, Hey, no more of this, no more of this here. Yeah. Let's start putting together our ideas. And if we're going to step out there and speak our peace we have to be prepared we have to when someone says okay well what do you guys think what do you guys want we got to be able to say exactly what we want exactly. because they don't give a fuck about all the emotions and stuff they don't give a fuck about that and right. neither do i anymore yeah. i just want to know okay since you asked this is what it looks like for us and here's the reasons why because mm -hmm. we're, we're we're valuable we're right. valuable. We actually send a lot of your great grandchildren to school. Mm. We've, been, we've been taking care of your family for years mm. because of the, the, the equity that you make off of me. And where is my community? I got a problem with that. Yeah. I don't have a problem with you being a racist. I got a problem with you being in my way for growth financially mm. and for my community. So therefore, when we get into a pandemic, yeah. We don't have any resources financially and we got to rely on you. It don't make sense. So let's start talking logic here. Right. Fuck emotions. Let's get into the business. Coco, well, you know, I saw your hand up, Coco. For a second. 
Yeah, um, I'm sorry. You want to say add definitely. something to that, Coco? I saw um, your hand up. She pretty, she pretty much said it. And for me, it was it was again, it was it was the vets. It, it's the vets because again, as an independent artist, I completely understand, agree. I'm aligned. I'm fucking right there, right now, having conversations, looking at contracts. And now being able to, you know, people asking questions, well, what do you want, Coco? And I really had to sit down and be like, okay, who can I talk to? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because um, there are some conversations that have, have have happened with vets where it's like, well, you got to earn your stripes. And that's a part of the game. And I went through that. So it's like, no, you're supposed to help make it better for the next generation. One. That's right. And that's two, right. The same right. way there's a space where there's a certain privilege that comes with obviously the work and the honor and the glory that comes with all of the work that the vets do. It's like, mm-hmm. we need that education. We need that knowledge. And it has to be deeper than, well, yes. you got to earn your stripes. Has to, there's something that it's like, well, we want it to be better we want it to be better in the long run for the next generation. So it's like, it's a space where something has to pull in where the vets even would, we would need them to speak for us and say, nah, I'm not doing this unless that. Yes. You know, that's going to, that's going to be important for us to to move forward because beyond it, it's like, yes, your families are going to be good. And then it's like, well, the next generation that's looking up to you and wants to do exactly what you did in Mm -hmm. a, in a, in, in a music industry that has changed um, drastically with the way that people are even paid <laughs> um, in any regard with, 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 with new paperwork and new terms and new things and new ways to actually get it out to the world with their artists that are making a bunch of money in other areas that never ever touch radio and artists that only get to radio unless they're underneath this specific umbrella or underneath this specific, um, right. uh, you, it, there are so many dynamics that are different, but the ones that have lasted for this long have seen it change from what it used to be to what it is and are still doing it and have an understanding that we're still trying to understand. So it's, it's going to be important in those spaces for mm-hmm. your voices to be heard and for you to speak to the people we can't speak to be like, let's get together and try this, you know? Um, so th- that's, I was just piggybacking off of what you were saying. Like, yes, yes, yes. I, yes. I want, I want to, I want to switch gears just a little bit and, and, and talk about some facts very quickly and Mm -hmm. please everyone here, feel free to chime in. I want to give some facts um, about our deeper history as it roots back to Africa. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know these following instruments were invented in Northern Africa. The, the Goji, which is a one string fiddle, one string fiddle, um, it was invented in Nigeria during the Stone Age. Um, the, ban- the banjo was also um, invented in Northern Africa by the Moors. The guitar, which was first known as the Krar harp, and then later the guitaro was again introduced to Europeans by the Moors. The drums obviously is a core of African music. Again, the Moors introduced this not only to folks in Europe, but to the Roman military. And uh, the, the more division of the Roman military had, had such an impact with their drumming and it became a staple through militaries throughout the world. Um, even the piano, the, the jimbri, which is the African bass guitar, all of these things originated in Northern Africa. And, and it's funny because I was never taught this in school. Never. Right. Never. You know, I never knew about a lot of that stuff in school. I had to do my own research and to find that out. So a lot of, you know, again, how music shapes us, we, we never learn these things in school. No. Right. You know, the plays played the banjo. And we, I just explained where that actually came from and how. And the Moors, people sleep on the Moors, but the Moors introduced modern civilization to the Europeans, to 100%, Spain. 100%. You know, to 100%. Italy. You know, before okay. Europeans were living in the same house with their mm-hmm. animals. You know, they all slept under the same roof and the Moors invented the, the, the compass and the compass and, and a whole bunch of int- instruments. And they actually traveled to the Americas ahead of Christopher Columbus. Another thing we right. know, school, mm. um, the Moors were here before him, you know. So there's a lot of history that I feel like we all should know we need to pass this on. Pass Absolutely. This on. Absolutely. It's oral tradition. Thank Just you. like much of music was was uh, oral tradition, also. I was telling you know, a lot of the a lot of the songs that uh, are recognized as Negro spirituals. Let's yeah. say Ooh. those songs were African songs, and those songs were also they mutated from African songs 
by necessity mm -hmm. so that uh you know they could be able to communicate secret messages to one another from one community to another so they could also deliver messages of education they could teach within those songs and pass those traditions along um it wasn't until i mean for all the slave masters knew these guys were embracing the christianity that was forced upon them and you know once they removed them removed their 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 native african religions from them you know from the different different cultures that were there they removed that and gave everyone Christianity to follow. Didn't right. allow them to read, but gave them Christianity, yeah. you know. Um, you know what's crazy, James? I was telling somebody, I was telling somebody that, oh, I was talking to my friend Cliff and we were talking about this whole bit of what's happening right now. And every other, every other culture in America, right, you know, are immigrants. Right. You know? Um, they don't consider us immigrants, right? Because we were, a lot of us were brought over here. And Mario, to your point, a lot of us were here already. Right. You know, like they don't, they don't teach that at all. No, no. Not well, see, they all. don't want that aspect of the culture, of our culture revealed because it's too much of an embarrassment to the country. Yeah. The country. A lot of us were here already. That's really what it boils down to, unfortunately. But I, so, 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 Jimmy, you said something about us creating our own economic, you know. Base based on structure and you know of course through this time a lot of things people are starting to learn a lot about our, our culture and, and what we've been through you know what i mean um and i like to point the the, the tulsa black wall street situation mm -hmm. you know that that's one of, of many situations like that by the way too they highlight that but we, we yeah. did that a few times right yeah. um um but let's talk about this right when we go off and do our own shit, mm -hmm. we say, yo, you know what? Y'all don't want us. We don't want to be around y'all. We're going to build our own shit, right? Mm -hmm. We go off and build our own shit and we build multi-millionaires. We build a thriving community, a thriving town, a thriving, our own banks, our own business, our own shit, right? Mm -hmm. Away from white people. I mean, you know, I don't know if we've got white people in the chat, you know, whatever, but away from white people. He said, hey, okay, y'all don't like us. All right, cool. We came over here against y'all. Y'all brought us here, you know, or, or whatever, whatever the story is. Okay. Mm -hmm. We build our own shit. Right? Then the government or white people say, Oh, you motherfuckers are thriving too tough. We're gonna go fuck this shit up. See, I don't, I I, I wanna, I don't wanna interrupt you, like, but I think that that's not the answer either like there's there's our music is so global that it's not good for business for us to even say okay now we're gonna go all black well, I, mean, now, I, now, I get it i agree i agree with that but it's right like, you know i'm I thinking that what's next is just figuring out what the paperwork needs to look like so that the business that you know we can do business with anybody but just like any business deal we have the 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 um the foundation and 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 the right to say hey uh this needs to look like this like let's do the business let's go we need each other let's go right. and all i'm saying is let's put a proper value mm -hmm. on what we're contributing to life your livelihood the livelihood of the world we can't take music and act like it's just oh this is just uh complimenting uh life no like there's there's business that's being uh, actually so much around it that this is this is actually the answer i feel to uh to to black wealth because think about it think if you think about what we have as a product if i'm if i'm making these dresses this is the i have a, sp a specific cut and sew a design this is what i own that's my product and a lot of a lot of my life maybe i took time to come up with this fabric and the way that i do my stitching do you know what i mean this is now a product that i have to have a business conversation with and say hey this is why you're gonna love this because of the way it fits you, the way you're going to be able to walk into your meeting and it lays on you properly, the money, the checks that you're going to make as soon as somebody sees you in this dress. That's the conversation, is the music is what we have lived 
blood, sweat, crafted. There's so much grit and soul and happiness and joy that can only have come from our history and our dark days and our bright nights, period. Well, you know, I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying and what you're saying is so true. But I think the issue is that once we get to that level of economic, you know, okay, you got your, your dresses and everything popping mm -hmm. and selling, you're making $3 billion annually, you're doing your thing. White folks want to buy you out. And most times, black people yeah. they get this offer mm -hmm. so much money. Girl, they came to the house and they offered me $47 billion for my dress company, child. Well, oh, right. I'm not going to say no to that. I'm just, just, I'm just going to tell you, you come to my house and you, I'm, I'm making $3 billion a year. You know, mm -hmm. I'm grossing. And then you want to buy my company out for $47 billion or offer $15 billion? Or, okay, I'm out. But what I believe you're saying is in the, in the cons, cons, construct of that, if you're going to buy me out, here is the paperwork that we need, okay? Uh, it's yeah. still got to be black. You hey, can't we're creative. Yeah. We're creative. We can take that money and turn it into <clears throat> a whole nother uh, show. So, I understand, but I mean, you know, that to me, that's another issue that we always getting bought out by folks before. You know, I mean, we always getting bought out, so it's kind of hard for us to have the black mentality or the ownership mentality because as soon as we get to a certain level, then somebody comes and buys us out or either copies us and blows us out, you know? Let me put it in perspective as far as music is concerned, right? Because, mm -hmm. Jimmy, you, you're being specific about, uh, about our craft, right? Right. L.A. Reid and Babyface had a company called LaFace Records, mm -hmm. right? LaFace right. Records had Tony Braxton, TLC, Usher Raymond, Outkast, right? Yes. By far, market share controlled the market share at Arista Records. Right. By far. Right. By far, okay? Right. L.A. Reid, who we regard, you know, who I regard as a legend and a brilliant creative and a brilliant executive, okay? okay. Wanted to, he, 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 he didn't have the presence of mind to say, LaFace is bigger than Arista. Wow. Right. Like, why would I sell my company to Arista Records? Why would I let these, these white people at BMG who don't want to fuck with Clive no more temporarily? Mm. Because you understand, you said something earlier that I want to, I want to pick it back on. Mm -hmm. They are strategic. It's not mm -hmm. emotional. Yes. Right. Not Absolutely. emotional. Yeah. We are an emotional people. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For them, right. it's not emotional. So, yeah. So BMG looked at Arista and they said, okay, Clive has LA. He got Puff Daddy. He got Dallas Austin. He got all these deals. Nash uh, Arista Nashville's popping. Arista Records proper mm -hmm. is popping. We don't want to pay Clive no more. How do we, how do we break this up? Mm -hmm. Oh, the black man who wants to be Clive Davis, who doesn't see that his company is worth more, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Then, then, you know what I mean? He doesn't see it. He, mm -hmm. he, he wants to say that, oh, I'm the chairman of Arista Records. Right. Making right. the face right. Arista, right? right? So we're going to go to him and make him turn against his mentor, the mm. guy who put him on. Mm. Right? We're going we're gonna to make him turn against him. Mm. We're going to offer him Harvard Business Law School, we're gonna offer him, we're gonna give him Arista Records, chairman, CEO, Arista Records. Mm. Him and Babyface are already beefing anyway. Kenny probably don't wanna be, we're gonna break that up. Let's, let's right. break that up too. Right. Because right. Mm -hmm. Kenny wants to be a producer, he wants to run a record label, even though they're making millions of dollars together. Right. As a label. We're gonna break that up. We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna fuck that completely up, all right? Mm. And we're gonna buy this company. I think they bought LaFace for like 35 million or something like that, $37 million. We're gonna give them $35 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, now mind you, a record that goes diamond, okay? Mm -hmm. A record goes diamond. Good. That generates $100 million for a label, right? right? Minimum, minimum, because we're saying $10 a record versus 10 million records. Right. Oh, that's a minimum, 100 million, right? Usher sold. Five million my way records, mm -hmm. eight million eighty seven on records, eighty seven on records, ten million confession records. Okay, mm. 
the love below. We're not going. We, we're not even going to talk about Outcast, platinum after platinum after platinum. We're going to talk about the one album that sold twenty million. Pink, who was on LaFace Records, sold twenty million. Mm -hmm. All right, they gave them guys through thirty-five million dollars, and they generated a fucking billion dollars with four artists. And that, why do you think they did that? Did, like, were they just un not, not knowledgeable? Or? Yeah, what I'm trying to understand. It's not about knowledge. It's about clout. Mm. Okay? It's about what we deem as important. Right? Mm. So, mm. L.A. Reid, who I admire, and I think is a great... We, 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 a lot of us wouldn't be here because of, if it weren't for him. You know what I mean? So I do not... I do not mean this in the mean in the meaning way i'm just saying that mm -hmm. as black people and we climb up the ladder we want we want what the white man has right right david geffen didn't give a fuck who david geffen david. did not give a geffen. fuck this company for 300 million dollars right right and with that and with that and with that you got to make i got to be the the the, 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 the chairman of the board of warner mm -hmm. i got to own part of whatever the fuck i'm selling you know what i mean like he didn't give right. a fuck he right. didn't care about the clout. You know what I'm saying? Right. You want to be what? Well, I want to be Clive. So I'm a, so, okay, you're going to put me in a position to be Clive? You're going to yeah. X Clive out? Cool. Right. I'll take it. I'll take right. the $5 a year uh, uh, CEO shit and I'll take it. Right? right. And I'm going to sell my company and me and my best friend are now, we're now partners in what we're on the opposite end of the, of, of, of the spectrum. And you, right. got, you got a billion dollars worth of shit for $35 million. And for me to be the chairman and CEO, and I can say I'm the chairman of Arista Records. I got Clive's company. Now, right. that yeah. happens, right? Yeah. yeah. That happens. And yeah. it's, a, it's a shame. It's a uh, shame that all of that stuff has to be owned now by white people like Motown. Well, well, all well, well. But hold on, hold on. I'm not finished. We, we, we're right there. It happens, right? Yeah. It happens. Yeah. He becomes the chairman and CEO of Arista Records. And he sells the face records. And now he controls the whole fucking Arista Records, right? They mm -hmm. out, they out Clive, they, they kick Clive out, right? Clive then goes to the boss's boss. They outed Clive when he was at the top of his game, Santana, all that shit, right? Out of him. He says, yo, I generated all this money. I created this fucking company. This is mm -hmm. my shit. So now the, the bosses of the people who outed me, fuck y'all. I'm going to go because I'm Clive Davis. I'm going to go to the boss's boss. The same company that Fucked him. Mm -hmm. like, shitted on him to get LaFace, to get all that shit, right? Wow. They fund his new label. They, they give him J Records, right? So then he gets to take all of his top staff that was at Arista. They jumped right over. Right? He mm -hmm. gets to take all of his brilliant right. minds that was at Arista mm -hmm. and start J Records on the, on the, in the hills of who? Olivia and fucking Alicia Keys, two black artists who was, you know what I mean? Like, let's really talk about it. So, mm -hmm. so, so not now me, the conspiracy guy, I'm looking like, is that the play the whole time? Was right, the, right. Guess what, guess, guess what ended up happening? Could have been. Clive Davis ends up being, you know, Jay, Jay Riggs is a blowing up. Clive Davis ends up becoming the chairman. Sony and BMG merges. Clive Davis become, becomes the president and CEO of Sony Music USA, and mm. guess what? The first thing they do on the heels of Confession selling fifteen million, on the heels of fucking Outkast selling twenty million, what do they do? They fucking fire L.A. Reid in the midst See? of of his top. So now, guess what? They got his company. They lulled him. They they, they lured him in to to, wow. to the whole thing. Hey, like oh. <laughs> You're the chairman of Arista Records. That's three years into him being successful as fuck. Right. Bob Davis becomes the, the president of Sony Music, Sony BMG USA, and they fire LA. And guess who has Arista back? Clive. Bob <laughs> Davis gets his company back and he has your company too. So, so yeah. Brian, is it safe to say that it's not worth selling out? It, that's the whole point. Absolutely. Tell the motherfuckers. <laughs> If you are the person, right, that's creating the culture, like for example, right now, right, um, 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 Coach, Coach K and Q uh, and, uh, and P for QC, they are the culture right now. You know what I mean? They're the culture and they own the majority of their company. You know what I'm saying? 
I say, keep it. Yes. Fuck them. You know what yeah. I mean? Take over Motown. Take over Cali. Yeah. Be, become, because you are, you are the greatest asset. Right. Capital, Capital proper is not selling no fucking records. Motown proper is not selling no records. It's QC. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So fuck them. Take, yeah. take them over. Yeah. That's the mentality that I wish yeah. um, L.A. Reid, because he had the power. Mm. He had the power, he had the records, he had the artists. Mm -hmm. He could have fucking taken that yeah. building yeah. over. Yeah, yeah that's why we have that's to That's my it. whole point, is that we sell everything that we, you know, yeah. the Bob Johnson's, the Barry Gordy's, the, you know, we sell everything, man, and we can't take that mentality going forward for the next no. generation. It's we can't take that it's based yeah. on what we idolize. And if you're idolizing like a position over ownership, then mm. what you idolize is what you're going to go for. It's like, yeah. right. Clive, Clive, Clive. I want to be Clive. And you got a position right. to be Clive. Yeah. You only was, you only were able to be Clive for three years. And that's what that's you definitely a, a narrative that really? we switched because we prior all over the world, we've been used to prioritizing clout. You know, you see it on IG, people not who they say they are. You know, mm. right. Everybody yeah, going to look a certain way versus owning. Mm -hmm. But you, but but we in a new day, so we're looking to move out of that yep. and embrace ownership, embrace you know, yep. knowing who we really are. Yeah. And, and also, I, too, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jimmy. Oh go no, ahead. I just um just also too. I really really value, um, you know, just in my personal journey, I had to get to a point where. Um, I learned not to beat myself up on, on choices that I've made because I don't Come believe on. in mistakes. I believe in choices and better choices and better choices, you know? And so even, um, Brian, you sharing all of that good knowledge, man, I love that what you just said. I mean, I could visualize it and, and to me, it's like God speaking straight to me and telling me a story of why. I am where I am right now and, and bringing back so much vision and clarity into why my path has been what it's been. So again, going back to the top of this call, like I'm, I am so happy that we're having this conversation and in particularly with you guys, all of you guys. And, and I'm just really looking forward to the new, and I think it takes the old to redefine the new, you know, to make better choices. So, you know, again, I'm just excited to be Amen. a part of this, this conversation. Well, I, I have a question for everybody. Um, so we say uh, white privilege. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to know, because I'm, 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 I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm lis listening to all of you and I'm looking at you guys. And I want to know, do you... Uh, do you have black privilege or do you embrace the black mm. privilege that you think you may not have? Yeah. Because see what it is, it's, it's a lot of things that we're going to have to reprogram as black people. You know, mm. we, you know, you may feel like, well, you know, I'm not a slave. My great, great, great grandmother was a slave, but mm. I'm not a slave, you know, but that stuff has been passed down. It's still in you no matter what, just like the blood of all of the slaves and people that died in this country mm -hmm. are still in the ground that stuff is still in us. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that we don't realize that we have to change or we have to reprogram. So yeah. I don't walk out of the door. It, it pisses me off sometimes, but I, I feel like I have just as much privilege as anybody. Mm -hmm. White or black, you know what I mean? So it's like my question to us as a people is, what is our privilege? We have, we have so much privilege. I think we focus on so much of the, what other people have, what white people have and what white, the white man and blah, 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 that we don't really focus on what the privilege that we have. And what we have what here on this CSAC call, <laughs> if nothing else, we have the greatest privilege of all and that's the privilege of creativity yep. and the creator of music. And CSAC for me, <laughs> I don't care who owns CSAC, Blackstone, Whitestone, I don't care. CSAC has been such a, a anchor for me. Mm. And, you know, CSAC is, is my privilege. You know what I mean? I, I love CSAC and I'm thankful for CSAC because I didn't know what, uh, you know, from 14, I can't, and I don't want to say how many songs that <laughs> were released and that I never got paid for between 14 and 21. <laughs> I mean, we don't even want to talk about that. But mm. the lessons that I learned 
the lessons that I learned in in having an organization like CSAC, Norman Norman um, Oldham. Uh, Norman Oldham was a white guy from New York, and he was old. He was an old man when I got to CSAC at fourteen, mm -hmm. and he didn't see color. <laughs> Norman mm -hmm. Oldham was the coldest, most loving man that I've ever met, you know, in my life. I mean, the first record I got from at 14 years old was from my mother's do uh, head doctor at Ben Top. He gave me uh, Art Blakey at the Blue Note. He gave me, that was my first jazz record. That's because I was a drummer. So that's how I really got into jazz drumming. And my whole point about that is that white people have con contributed to all of us, mm -hmm. that loved all of us. So I just want everybody to think about the privilege that we have. We, got, we have black privilege. If you want to put it in a color, okay. Well, we have black privilege, but we're, we, maybe we're afraid to use it. Maybe we're afraid to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're afraid to step up to it. But owning, like you said, I can look at you and tell you're not no follower. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're a strong leader. We need, we need you now, smoking mm -hmm. off. We need you <laughs> now. And whatever I got to do to help you do what you need to do, I'm there. So... We have privilege, guys. And uh, I, 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 I want I want to piggyback, Greg. I, I was I was I was telling somebody that in order for us to get where we're trying to go, you know, we always had allies. We always had white allies. So you know, even if you, you think about the the Civil War, it was white mm -hmm. people that said, "Yo, this shit is wrong." Yeah, right? we're going to you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it was it was white people saying to other white people like, "Yo, this shit is wrong, man." I mean, even though. We know that there's an economic thing, an element that was right. a part of it. You know what I mean? Right. But ultimately, it was white people saying, hey, all right, this shit is wrong. We're, we're, we're battling each other right now because this shit is wrong. And if you slaves, y'all want to come be free, y'all come fight with us and we'll mm -hmm. fucking win this war. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there is a level of, you know, of like, we, we need each other. Yes. Right. You know what I'm saying? We need each other. Yes. We need progressive thinking yeah. folk that really get it, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, like, well, I, somebody said in the, um, in the chat that, you know, it, it's, it's we, we, we can't fight the battle. Like, separation is not really the answer. No. It's not, it's, we're too powerful. We, we, we are teachers. We inspire people all over the world. Like, we, technically, we take the role of who we and, are. In, re in reality... It's, it's impossible for us to separate. We're so That's intertwined. Right. In, the, um, in the culture, you're absolutely right. We're so right. intertwined. Like, there's no the American way. American culture is us as a culture. Exactly. Yeah, we're so intertwined. Come on. Yeah. You know. And that's but a compliment. Right. That's really a compliment um, when you look around and, and you see how many people uh, of all races are, are inspired by who we are. And so I think what you said, Greg, so important um about our privilege our privilege is what we have and i think at least for me my success um and wow success we spend a lot of time on communication like we really really uh what i realize about white folks is there is a conversation that they respect come on you understand and so um, and it's taken years. I've always been a good communicator. We're mm -hmm. all, as writers, we're expressionists. But in terms of the business, it's really about logic. Because even, I'll share a story that, that may have something to do with this or not. But I remember getting on a plane one day when I was um, on tour with an artist. And I walked up to my seats and there was two white folks that were very much what we would call rednecks okay mm -hmm. and at that moment i had to make a choice i could either sit down i'm like okay this is how this is gonna go i mean i could see i could feel it coming off of them so and i said something told me the spirit told me it's up to you jimmy to 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 create the climate here you let's see what power you have so i said okay let me come in and I'm going to dominate this with my energy. Without going through the whole conversation, by the time we got off that plane, 
I had gotten them passes to the festival that I was performing at, headlining, that they couldn't even get in. They had been trying for two days. I got them backstage passes. They were inviting me to Montana to please stay on the lake. Like, <laughs> what I realized, I said, damn, it's that easy to just be beautiful, to be loving, to extend ourselves. What it taught me was that, that racism comes from not knowing, like not being able to um, attach or relate in some kind of way. And mm -hmm. every, if you think about the logic of people, people just want to be loved. I don't give a yeah. fuck what color you are. If you change the narrative and you say to the person that maybe you don't think is so cute, but maybe you lie that day and you say, you know what? I love your, your hair. Your hair is beautiful. That, you will see somebody's face turn from looking mm -hmm. like this to, oh, mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. It's that easy. Mm -hmm. So it's about that connect, it's a about little that bit connection. of this and a little bit of that, and you actually bring in a business conversation and say, hey, look, guys, here's the logic in all this. Yeah. Everybody's going to be happy if we just make these adjustments here and there. Mm -hmm. Everybody's right. gonna be happy. Right. Don't worry about there's not enoughness. Like everybody's gonna be happy if we get this business right and we and we start taking off with taking care of our own people. So you don't have to take care of us. We can take care of ourselves. We can create our own narrative, but we have to be responsible. I'm gonna wrap this up. We gotta be responsible with our narrative because we're not gonna be able to position ourselves to have these conversations of logic and business if we continue with this loose narrative of we're right. gangsters and we're whores and we suck in this and we doing that, I get it. I love the ratchetness. I love all of it. I, I'm, I'm with it. I'm with the smoke. But I also know how to turn the smoke off and I know how to have a conversation and, 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 and uh, be in the midst of any type of uh, caliber of person and say, hey, this is what I want. And with the joy that comes off of my spirit, because I believe in God and I believe in the intricacy and perfection of, of God's uh, design, I'm gonna go in there and just be me. And I'm gonna make somebody say, you know what? I, I wanna be around this girl, period. Right. Or I wanna be around this man. I wanna be around this person because they make my life better. So it, it, we have to change the conversation. We have to put our emotions to, not to the side, but just try to neutralize our emotions as black people. And we have to bring that, bring from the depths of our core, who we are and what we can bring to the table and just make it make sense to folks. Let's work together, but let's make it make sense for all of us. That's it, that's all I'm saying. Well, I think, I think that the reason why we're having this conversation is because the powers that be in this country are now so uneasy because the playing field is, is, is leveled, it's getting more leveled. And so the young generation, they're not taking it anymore. I saw one of the, the Instagram posts that said, this is the last generation you fuck with, mm -hmm. okay? So people, the, the playing field in the music business in, in, in entertainment period, I mean, in every, in every aspect, it's, the playing field is, is leveled. Yo. And right. young people what don't up, care what about up, what they don't care about black or white. They don't care about none of that. You know, they just know that, you know, we have an equal opportunity now. We can sell our own records. We can put a record out every week if we want to. Yeah. Right. And that right. makes some and, people and many really people pissed are. off and pissing a lot of people off, which right. is, to your point, which is what's good, what needs to happen is we need to feel comfortable in pissing people the fuck off. Mm -hmm. right. Very comfortable instead of allowing us to be pissed off for someone right. else. You know, like I make, the, I make the point about, you know, when, when some people I talk to and they go like, yeah, man, you know, we was over there the other day. And uh, then, you know, when I, I'm sorry, white people. I'm like, why are you whispering <laughs> white people, my nigga? Like, for real, why? Like, what is that inside of your head that, that make you feel so uncomfortable or so afraid or so disrespectful that wow. you have to whisper when wow. you say the word white people? Right. Hey, man, we just, you're just important. We're all just as important as anybody else on this planet. So that's the, that's the issue. And I think that that's where we need to grow from. We need to grow from the fact that we're making so many people uncomfortable and these young people don't give a damn and they're out here doing their thing. We need to ride with them and go with them. And like you said, right. give them that, that push that they need and that support that they need and historically and, and, and you know, push them through the roof, man. And let's, you know, yeah. let's 
be a, a powerhouse. Let's just do power it. Up. Let's right. power up. Mm-hmm. And James, to too. We really need you, James, because you, uh, you know, you work on a whole different level and you have a, a, a access to a lot of information that can help us. So we're going to be pulling on you. And yeah. um, that's why I've been here. That's why I continue to do what I do. Right. That's right. Appreciate you, my brother. I continue to do what I do. Thanks, yeah. James. We appreciate you, brother. Thank oh, you, thank and you Mario, for putting it. this together, too. Absolutely. I think 